We'll come back into order. If the people whose names are on the list could please come forward, you can sit in these four chairs that are just behind the dais. And then if your name appears on the list, you don't have to wait for the person ahead of you. Just come up to the dais and we'll hear two minutes of comments, please. Hello. My name is Julia Fritz Endress, and it's spelled correctly up there. Thank you for having me today. I am a resident of Minneapolis, and I am here because the FEIS is inadequate, and I urge you to deny all permits for this pipeline. I was there in June of 2018 when you, the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, heard us tell you the truth, loud and clear. The Line 3 pipeline, if built, would cause irreparable harm to the world's climate, to our land and water resources, and to all people who call Minnesota home. You heard us tell you that building this pipeline would be in direct violation of treaties between the Ojibwe people and the U.S. government, denying their rights to hunt, fish, and harvest wild rice. You heard us, and yet you refused to stand up for us. You refused to protect the people of the state who are already experiencing the effects of climate change, rising temperatures, record rainfalls, and floods like we've never seen. I am 22 years old, and I don't have the choice whether or not to fight for a livable climate. My generation has to live the future that you are gambling away. All I ask of you today is that you listen, actually listen, when we tell you that this pipeline would be a disaster for all of us. Line 3 would create more annual greenhouse gas emissions than what all of Minnesota emitted in 2016. That would cancel out all of the state's climate efforts if we build this pipeline. We need to move together as a state towards our climate goals. And the last thing we should be doing is putting another pipeline in the ground. More and more people are realizing this. Among those people are the thousands of students who skip school to come to the Capitol building and participate in the global youth climate strike, which was bigger than the world has ever seen. Since June of 2018, our movement has only gotten stronger. This past September, 1,000 people gathered on the shores of Lake Superior in Duluth, all voicing their opposition to this pipeline. Minnesota's own Department of Commerce appealed the PUC's decision to approve the pipeline. I ask that you stand with us because we have hope. We, our movement believes that we can make a renewable energy future and transition with the speed that science requires of us. We believe that it's not a choice between job growth and protecting the earth and its people, that we can do both together. And we need you to be on our side. Please stand with us and work with us towards building a better future for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Zoe Splendorio Giebel, and that is spelled correctly. It seems in this case that the facts matter very little, so I will not plead with you to stop this pipeline based on facts. I plead with you as a fellow human. I call on your most basic instincts as as a person to value life, love, and safety, which has come before and will continue long after the fall of our precious economy. Before money, there were thousands of years that humans have lived off the land, and although we are seemingly more removed than ever, we are no less dependent. We all benefit from the use of fossil fuels, but that is not what is in question here. Regardless of our beliefs, we have all gathered here to say that our right to exist is important, we are fighting for our lives, and no matter what the decision, we will still be fighting for our lives. <sighs> what do we want to leave this world with? Because we can't take it with us. What story do you want to tell your kids? At the end of the day, what you are deciding is our future. What are we willing to sacrifice for our future? Are we willing to die for a system that pits us against each other? One that reduces people to their economic value and trades our many bodies to greatly improve the life of few, I'm not. What I'm willing to die for is a future where our needs as people come first, and as a broke college farmer myself, let me say it isn't money I need, it is water, food, air, shelter, and people who make it all worth it. I was taught by our ancestors something that we all feel in our hearts, that no matter the amount of money, the the amount of pipelines or oil, they could never diminish our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Cheers.
Good afternoon. Um, my name is Steve Morse. Um, Joe Helsla has ceded his time to me. So I'll be speaking on his behalf. And um, welcome. Um, thank you for having this hearing. My name is um, Steve Morris. I'm with Minnesota Environmental Partnership. We are the state's largest coalition of environmental organizations and conservation organizations. And I just want to make a couple of points really quickly. First of all, we appreciate the opportunity to have this public hearing with the commissioners on this issue. Um, a couple points I want to make. You're hearing it day in, day out, but it's really important that we instill a sense of urgency about this issue. I think you understand that, but let me just underscore it. The terrain has shifted considerably since this issue was last before the Commission in June of 2018 with what we know now about climate, what, what, with what we know about the feedback loops that are occurring. So we need to act differently. We're fortunate to have a public utility commission here in the state to protect and look out for the public interest because we pay for the impacts of this pipeline. We pay for the impacts of the pipeline to our natural world around us, to the climate impacts, to the natural resource impacts, to the health impacts that you're hearing about. We also, in, in some bitter injustice, pay for the construction of it through cost recovery. And so we pay for it time and time again. So I'm very glad that you are sitting here to consider what the public impacts are to this. The last point I want to make is that we feel that the EIS, the supplemental EIS is flawed. And it's flawed, and, the, and, and its flaws are supported by the appeals court case that occurred just before Christmas in December 23rd of last year, which basically said in the Namaji Trails case, the appeals court said that if there is a source of pollution that is outside of the state, it is still incumbent upon the state to consider the impacts if they affect Minnesota resources. And so in the EIS, they looked at the spills in the Lake Superior at a point that is more remote to the lake, but in Minnesota, than if they looked at cases at spill areas within Wisconsin that are much closer to our most valuable resource, that being Lake Superior. So on your first finding, I just want to underscore, the EIS is not adequate. It has many problems, but that's just one, one that I can point out in this time frame. And I ask you to just keep in mind that it's become painfully clear over the last few months that the time for fossil fuel investment is over and we need to move on. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andy Pearson, A-N-D-Y-P-E-A-R-S-O-N. And it's my honor today to represent Minnesota 350 and our 20,000 supporters statewide uh, to be here in the first time the Public Utilities Commission has directly taken public comments on the Line 3 project since 2014. So today I speak to a commission that is held hostage uh, by its own description. There is a gun pointed at our heads. The gun is real and it is loaded. We all may remember those words of Commissioner Lipschultz on the day of the final decision in 2018. Well, you rarely make good decisions with a gun pointed at your head. So I'm here today to say let's put that down together. The record doesn't support the idea of a gun anyhow. We've opposed the Line 3 pipeline for nearly six years. Now, that may make you think I'm here to beg for the right decision today, but I'm not here to do that. I'm here because I believe in second chances. I'm here because I believe that everyone is fallible or able to make decisions that we might later regret. Now, that's just human nature. And I'm here because sometimes, even if we know they're the wrong decisions, we make them anyway. Um, and our conscience doesn't shut up about it. And I'm here to say that the best odds are it probably never will. Uh, because decisions that are hard but right, you know, they often hurt in the moment. Um, but then afterwards, you're at peace. You know, your, your soul is quiet about it. Decisions that are wrong, they might be easier in the moment you make them or even the days or, or the weeks after, uh, but then you have to live with them, you know, for the rest of your life, and, and they get to be worse roommates with each year that goes by. I believe in second chances, and that's why I'm here today. So where do we put our best hopes, right, our best ideals? I actually think we save a lot of those for children's books. Um, there's something about telling stories to young people who we care about, that maybe makes us connect with something in ourselves that's some kind of deep truth, you know, something that matters, something that's real. So I just want to close by asking a question. If this line three story was a children's book, how would it end? Thanks.
Hi, uh, my name is Eric Lee. Um, uh, that was spelled E-R-I-K-L-E-I-G-H. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I want to thank um, everyone for coming out and testifying, um, whether for or against Line 3. It's um, obviously an issue that touches every one of us um, in different ways. Um, so I think a lot of the very technical points have been made pretty well by um, a lot of people. Um, I, um, I want to suggest that um, uh, even, even about 10 years ago, um, the best kind of uh, models and, and statistics and just people working in renewable energy industry basically said, we have the technology already to make a transition to 100% renewables. It's a matter of investing and doing the work um, that we need to do to actually make that transition. It's, it's a mobilizing of society. Um, Enbridge actually um, has, some, uh, has some investment in renewables in the southern US um, in the form of hydropower, and um, I'm not sure exactly what other forms, but um, this Enbridge pipeline, um, I, I oppose it. Um, I think the climate, um, the climate repercussions are just too high. If Enbridge were to try to invest in renewables in that area to try to provide jobs for people in, our, um, in rural Minnesota who have difficulty getting jobs, I don't think you would see that kind of, the kind of opposition that we're seeing um, to this pipeline. So, um, you know, I, I would like to see us kind of try to actually invest our time and energy into making it easier for citizens of our state to take on um, to take on renewable uh, energy sources and to find ways to. Make, make a living off of those instead of fossil fuel extraction and burning. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jean Bodwin. My last name is B as in boy, A-U-D-H-U-I-N. No e. yeah. I'm a Layuna, Minnesota, North Dakota member. I'm a proud union journeyman laborer with local 563 out of Minneapolis. I consider myself an environmentalist. By definition, myself and Layuna members are concerned advocates for the protection of the environment. We support all efforts to reduce Minnesota's carbon footprint and the transition to renewable, clean, and carbon-free energy. Whether or not this pipeline is rebuilt has no impact on the consumption of oil, which is what we ought to be focusing our time and energy on to address our climate crisis. Pipelines reduce congestion on our roads, rail networks, and shipping system. They decrease the number of trucks from our highways, roads, and bridges, making traveling safer for all of us and reducing damage to our infrastructure. Everyone here, I'm sure, has hit a pothole. So we're looking for um, reducing congestion and the damage to our roads. We support real solutions to climate change. Stopping this pipeline will do nothing to fix our climate crisis. Doing so may actually undermine our environmental progress when this project has built in environmental protections for our water and the surrounding areas. The Canadian and Wisconsin portions of Line 3 are already completed. By halting or postponing reconstruction, we risk more damage occurring on the Minnesota section as well as other vulnerable areas. To reiterate the comments from my fellow laborer brother, Dan Olson, the Line 3 replacement is the most studied pipeline in state history. And I'm not telling you anything new. You've been here. I've been to several of these. You've put the time and energy in. Thank you. 
The Line 3 EIS is an in-depth 13,500 page environmental study of the project. It's time to deem it adequate. The new spill analysis confirms that replacing Line 3 is the best way to protect Lake Superior watershed. The new information is the final EIS strengthens the case for replacement. The existing pipeline runs in the same exact corridor as the new pipeline where it connects with the watershed. State agency staff developed the report in accordance with the law. It is more than adequate and it is past time to move the project forward. Thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to speak. Hello, my name is Felicity Carroll. Um, I am speaking for Buff Grace, and I'm reading from a letter that was published in the Star Tribune um, and signed by a plethora of Minnesotans. I think it is relevant and important. The premise of line three is that we need more oil, that the industry must expand. That simply does not reflect our actual energy needs as we steadily become more efficient and focused on clean, renewable energy. Minnesotans' own Department of Commerce re recommended that the state reject Line 3 project because Enbridge failed to show any potential Line 3 benefits that would outweigh the, outweigh the risks. This new project would send the carbon pollution equivalent of 50 coal-fired plants into the atmosphere we will be left to deal with the effects of a spill. Enbridge has a terrible spill record, but its project proposal leaves spill liability to Minnesotans. Meanwhile, Enbridge fought in court to collect 55 million in tax, it paid in taxes to Minnesota and is pressuring some of our poorest counties to accept its new project. Minnesota should respect tribal nations. Enbridge's consultation with the Anishinaabe tribes does not equal consent. Multiple directly impacted tribal nations have said no to Line 3. Over 500 religious leaders joined together in asking the PUC to reject Line 3. Clearly, Enbridge knows many Minnesotans realize the company doesn't have our best interests at heart. At the 11th hour, Enbridge offered to remove old Line 3 for some landowners instead of its original plan to leave it in the ground to rot. And it said that it will hire Native Americans to work on the new line if Enbridge cares it should put our state's workers and labor unions to work removing the old line three from private and tribal property and increase its renewables investment. Administrative law judge Ann O'Reilly recommended against the pipeline route and bridge wants. The thorough analysis of the DOC showed that there's no need for a line three on any route. There are already six Enbridge pipelines in Minnesota. Six is enough. <laughs> Our state officials should listen to the DOC and the 68,000 comments submitted by Minnesotans against the project. 94% of written public comments are in opposition. Please oppose it. Felicity Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L. -L. And who are you speaking for? Gra uh, Buff Grace. G-R-A-C-E. Yeah, B-U-F-F. -F. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to read a letter from Sherry Foss, who couldn't be here today. She's from Walker, Minnesota. Can, the you, line, say, can you say your name, please? Sir? Jay Hamango, J-A-Y-H-I-M-A-N-G-O. The Line 3 project in Minnesota has been taking too long for approval. Please let Enbridge know. Please let Enbridge know that we support all their efforts and see that this pipeline is the safest way to transport oil and to protect our natural resources. There are no trucks to worry about air pollution, ships to spill in the ocean, or safety of drivers and others on the freeway. Studies show that pipeline itself is superior to anything else out there. It is also more economical and crucial to our country's need for oil. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Kerry Wong. I was on the list uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, K-E-R-R-Y space W-A-N-G. Um, I live in Minneapolis and earlier this month, I graduated with my PhD in material science and engineering with a minor in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota. 
My research background is in mathematical modeling, and I love modeling because it allows us to make quantitative predictions about complex systems. And with that perspective, I find the current EIS wholly and hilariously inadequate because it says very little about quantifying those environmental impacts. The first sentence on the Minnesota Environmental Quality Board's website on environmental impact statement reads, the EIS provides detailed information about the extent of potentially sig significant environmental impacts of a proposed project. Keyword, the extent. That means it should inform us quantitatively how much of an impact a proposed project can have. So let's look at chapter 10 of the EIS, which deals with oil spills. It starts with some quantitative models in the worst case scenario, oil spills. Two types of oil, three flow rate cases, eight sites over 24 hours. It's not a bad start, but there's nothing that tells me how these oil spill scenarios actually affect the things that we care about. Instead, the following sections are littered with paragraphs of generic statements like, on aquatic species, mortality may occur as a result of direct exposure to high concentrations of oil. Crude oil released in the subsurface could accumulate at the water table. Where, how long would that take? Where along the route is that most vulnerable? None of these impacts are quantified or even geographically specific to line three. These could have been copy and pasted from a Wikipedia page on pipelines. Now, what's the point of having a detailed oil spill model if it's not followed up by analysis that actually informs us of the consequences. The EIS isn't an academic exercise. Besides, Enbridge admits Line 3 is expected to have a major spill in either our lifetime or our grandchildren's. Chapter 10, page 76, on the bottom of the page, reads, using a conservative approach, it was estimated that the volumes of spillage in the hypothetical Line 3 spill scenarios, ranging from 6,625 barrels to 16,239 barrels, might be expected once in a 26 to 99 years somewhere in the state of Minnesota. So it's going to happen, and we need to know what the risks we're dealing with. Sir, your time is up. Just to close, uh, today fossil fuels companies are using an array of complex mathematical models in their operations. Artificial intelligence, data and analytics, and statistical models are used to find optimal sites for drilling and scheduling of equipment. It's not at all unreasonable to ask these companies like Enbridge to use those same kinds of mathematics to generate some quantitative risk assessments on the metrics that we actually care about. So until the EIS can give us some hard numbers on the environmental impact, it should definitely be deemed inadequate and further permits of this project should be denied. Thank you. Hello, uh, David Lepic, spelled correctly up there. Um, I'm from St. Louis Park, Minnesota, and I vacation on Cass Lake, right along Line 3 in Chippewa National Forest and home of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. As a software engineer, I've seen a lot of industries disrupted by technology. I know what it looks like. Technological disruption looks like science fiction until it's in the rear view mirror. By the time Line 3 is replaced, it will be obsolete because of electric vehicles. Oil sands bitumen is not cost competitive at current prices and only makes sense if demand increases. Electric cars are already limiting demand for oil. I and others uh, drove one today. In the last year, electric vehicles have reached price parity with mid-priced cars and fleet vehicles. Last year, Amazon and UPS each ordered 10,000 electric delivery vans. That's 20,000 vehicles that won't use this oil. The world's biggest car maker, VW, has just converted its Zwickau factory to electric with intent to phase out diesel and gas cars. This year, Tesla has the capacity to build half a million vehicles and continues to increase capacity in the US, China, and Germany. It sells every vehicle that it builds. Ford and GM are fighting back with the electric Mustang and soon Hummer and F-150. Germany, France, Norway, and Ireland will stop sales of new gas and diesel cars by 2030 in 10 years. China's date is ASAP. But by 2030, with the current rate of change, nobody will want a noisy, slow, overpriced gas car. They'll be obsolete. Line three will be an expensive, dangerous, and useless boondoggle, and we'll have to clean up after it. Thank you.
Ambuwashtay, good day. I'm speaking uh, on behalf of Nicole Weller. She's deferred her speaking time to me. I am Chief Nathan Passup from the White Bear First Nations. It's located in uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, in the southeast corner of the uh, province. Um, first off, um, we've had uh, engagement agreements with Enbridge. Uh, the right of way does go just north of our, of our traditional territory. And we've had a really strong working relationship with Enbridge. And I would also like to take this time to acknowledge the Dakota, the Anishinaabe, and the Ojibwe peoples of this land. And um, historically, uh, the sad part about this, this state is that the, the biggest mass hanging happened here in Mankato, where 30, 38 Native warriors were hanged in 1864. So that's a dark part of the history. And a lot of the Dakota live in Canada now. And this was their traditional lands, and so their diaspora within Canada. You know, it would be nice for them to be able to be repatriated back or, or at least acknowledged historically. They uh, acted out in, uh, in survival at that point because they were starving to death. But beyond that, I just wanted to acknowledge the Dakota and also Enbridge. Uh, we've, we've had a really good working relationship with them in regards to economic development, community enhancement and also cultural environmental monitoring. We have the Pipestone Valley there. It's a sacred, sacred valley for us and we will continue to monitor that as well through the right of way. So I know that um, going forward, we're gonna be doing our own monitoring as well. And we hold Enbridge accountable in Canada. And so I hope that Minnesotans do the same thing. You have a very hard decision to deal with as a commission, but I wish you the best and uh, look to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's N-A-T-H-A-N, PASAP, P-A-S-A-P. If your name is on the list, you're welcome to come forward now. Otherwise, we'll take all of these names off and start over. Good afternoon. My name is Verdell Thunderhorse, just the way it was spelled. Me and my friend were driving through a reservation on the way to a golf tournament, and we see this dilapidated house, and he says, your people need to take care of their homes. And I tell him, these aren't our homes. These are the government homes that we rent. Native Americans were never allowed to prosper on their reservations. They were never allowed to create wealth. We've been in this domestic violence relationship with the government for a long time, 150 years. What do, what do perpetrators do to their victims? They isolate them. They put us on land that was inhabitable, unfarmable. What do they do? They keep their victim helpless. They say, we don't, we're gonna keep you dependent on us. They also keep their dependent from justice. Those protection orders that domestic violence people get, those are our treaties. They roll right through them without any regard for the rule of law. <coughs> Excuse me, I have to run up here. Um, and I wanted people to know that. I don't think they understand that. I don't think they, they realize that, that we've been traumatized. Gandhi said, violent, um, Poverty is an act of violence. We've been traumatized over and over and over again. When is it gonna end? When are the, when are the Native Americans gonna be able to start to prosper? No, you guys have the power. We don't have any power. We were rendered powerless, politically, economically, socially. You have the power and we need you to be the warriors our warriors, when they were fighting for their people, they threw their eagle staffs in the ground and they said, we're not gonna back down. Now, I know that you're in a tough spot, but I also realize that they probably look at you like figureheads and paper tigers, these corporations. They probably think, well, I'll just put a stack of bills in their hands and they're gonna do our bidding. 
but we need you to stand up. We need you to protect us because we don't have power. Native Americans do not have power. There's a saying, a quote that says, something like, uh, the fate you tolerate can be your own. Someday in 10, 15 years, you, your children, your grandchildren might be living in a car or living alongside in a tent by the freeway. You can see it happening across America right now. You can see the homelessness, the, the panhandling, the opioid addiction, the suicides. Things are happening right now that's happened to us already. We've struggled all our, through the generations and we're, and we're still gonna keep on struggling. And when, when this pipeline is coming and we have no say, you're our warriors. We need you to stand up for us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Wendy Darst, W-E-N-D-Y-D-A-R-S-T. I noticed that there's a lot of empty seats to my left. Fond du Lac, Red Lake Band of Chippewa, White Earth Band of Ojibwe. There's many missing people who probably have a lot to say about this issue. Um, this meeting conflicts with a TEC Tribal Executive Committee meeting on White Earth. So I would imagine that many of those people needed to be at a different meeting. I can't pretend that I speak for them. I don't. I only speak for myself as a resident of the state for about 30 years now. I came here from an area that was very polluted. I came here from an area dominated by fossil fuel industry, the Rust Belt. You might be familiar with the Rust Belt. Uh, that's where I grew up. Where I grew up is the land of Mike Pence. There's plants that are empty. There's weeds growing out of acres, miles of parking lots. There's people with no jobs. There's people with no economic hope. Is that what you want for this place? I don't think it is. I think it's time for us to transition. And for that reason and many more, I ask you to uh, reject the permits for line three and this horribly flawed EIS statement. We can't drink oil. And this state has the most beautiful, amazing resources. This pipeline crosses the Mississippi, what, two or three times? That endangers the water for millions and millions of people. Please don't build line three. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Wetzel, as correctly spelled on the monitor. Oh my goodness, have you seen the news? I just can't keep up. January 20th, Men Post reported on a Minnesota research project entitled, What Climate Change Means for the Future of Ice Fishing in Minnesota. The research does not bode well for the sport. One of the authors compared the diminishing ice cover to the coal miner's canary. Maybe the DNR's climate office is onto something in their documentation that winters in Minnesota since 1970 are warming 13 times faster than summers. Then there was a report about the DNR's recent roundtable conference of 500 stakeholders meeting for the day to talk about matters of concern with a significant emphasis on adaptations necessary due to climate change. Certainly you saw the letter from Larry Fink uh, to other CEOs and he said in that letter in part, a fundamental reshaping of finance is being driven by the recognition of climate change which will result in a significant reallocation of resources, unquote. The World Economic Forum met in Davos this month. 
for the first time, their annual risk survey put climate and other environmental threats ahead of risks posed by geopolitical tensions and cyber attacks. Maybe you saw the article in the Star Tribune on the 23rd about Moody, Moody's issuing a red flag to XL Energy because it is among the U.S. electrical utilities most exposed to increased risk from climate change due to water scarcity. Open the papers any day. We absolutely know the territory that we're in. In crisis intervention training, trainers always bring out two Chinese characters, uh, two Chinese characters which form the word crisis. The first one pertains to critical situation. The second one refers to opportunity. We are clearly in a crisis. The opportunity is plain in our face. It is to deny line three. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mila Ray. My name is spelled correctly up there. Um, I'm 16 and I should be in school right now. The Line 3 pipeline is already recorded to have problems with its functionality and along with the history of other pipelines has a high probability of leaking. The new proposed route will cause harm too for several reasons. It will go through native land, including water belts holding wild rice, which is a key resource to native communities. It has a high probability of leaking and ruining water quality as it goes under the Mississippi River. The new line will transport fossil fuels that will be burned, worsening the climate crisis. It will contribute to the missing and murdered indigenous women crisis with the creation of man camps in rural areas near indigenous communities where predominantly male workers have a large influx into the area and can abuse their power to exploit native women. If you need economic reasons as well, as far as I'm concerned, the tar sands industry is dying and as we move towards renewable resources. Um, and as it is dying, the need for more oil is not there and Minnesota refineries have all that they need According to the Department of Commerce, Oil and Market Analysis, Enbridge has not established a need for the proposed project. The pipeline would primarily benefit areas outside of Minnesota, and serious environmental and socioeconomic risks and effects outweigh limited benefits. For these reasons, along with many others stated by other people today, I ask the PUC to deny the, certifi the certificate of need and route permit and end the Line 3 project. It will inevitably, in, inevitably damage the environment, sacred native lands, further harm indigenous women, and has low economic value. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marcy Lessler. I live in Minneapolis. I'm a mother and a grandmother and I volunteer at the Sierra Club. I think that the final environmental impact statement is not adequate because it is really narrow, having been done on a single location and flawed in the lack of consideration for other locations. It does not address impacts to the Lake Superior watershed, especially the St. Louis River and estuary. Impacts to the St. Louis River and estuary and other waterways need to be considered. This analysis ignores the protected wetlands, natural areas, and parks that are along the St. Louis River and the bays and streams up lake, up, upstream of Lake Superior. Much restoration work has been done in the St. Saint, uh, Louis River estuary that costs millions of dollars, and this could be undone with a single oil spill. This is an infrastructure project that will last 30 to 50 years, and decisions about this should take that into account. I am very concerned about the future world we will leave to our children and grandchildren, and fossil fuel pipelines are not a viable part of the future. Line three would cause the same pollution as 50 coal power plants. The greenhouse gas emissions from the oil carried by this pipeline alone would surpass the emissions from Minnesota's entire economy on an annual basis. We need to be transitioning to renewable energy and weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. We need to be decommissioning pipelines, not building new ones. In conclusion, the FEIS falls short and the PUC should rule it inadequate and look further at the impacts for 30 plus years. 
long view. Thank you for letting me comment today. Thank you. Hello. My name is Tina Fredrickson. I'm a Roseville resident. I'm very proud that John Marty is my representative. Um, I was born in Minnesota, lived in Brown County, went to school at Moorhead State, uh, lived in Iowa for a couple of years, taught in Missouri, lived in Chicago, but ultimately I needed to come back home to Minnesota because it's the land of 10,000 lakes. I mean, who here hasn't been to Itasca State Park, crown jewel of our state park system? I've gone there for the last 10 plus years with my family and have fond memories of them going across the boulders, looking for fish, um, hearing the loons at night. At the rate we're going at right now, that's not going to be in existence in another 10 years. And certainly if this pipeline goes through, those, those waters are going to be contaminated. That is a known fact. Um, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a mom. Um, so I'm going to really implore you to pay attention to some of the younger speakers that have spoken so eloquently today. Andy, Sean, Christina, Grace, Julia, Emma, Andrew, Mia, Allison, Priya, Francis, Dylan, Regina, Nina, Julia, Zoe, Ryan, and especially Carrie Vang, who was so, so eloquent and backed up everything he said with science. The science is clear. This should not be going forward. So that is why I am here to say no to the, a, to the FEIS. It is inadequate. We should not be going forward with this pipeline. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it when our democracy here is at stake. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Simon Townsend. It's spelled correctly. Thank you for the, uh, taking the time to listen to people uh, today. Uh, I'm from Minnesota. I was born and raised in Roseville, Minnesota. I talk a little differently, but it's not an accent. Um, I come at this from the issue of climate change, which has been big on my mind the last five or six years. I also think about it from the global perspective and thinking about numbers. Um, after the financial crisis, I worked in D.C. at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and so what's given me hope recently is uh, global electric car sales growth year on year and global solar installation year on year. Globally, these uh, electric cars have been growing many years, 60% a year, and global electric uh, solar installations have been growing 40% a year. And so with just a little bit of Excel skills, you can you know, see what happens to electric car cells or solar cells when they grow at that rate. Uh, and so this is what gives me hope for climate change, uh, but it also uh, is what makes me think that you know, this line isn't necessary and won't be a good investment for our state. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Eleanor Haas has ceded her time to me. My name is Alan Richardson, A-L-L-E-N-R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S-O-N. -L -L -E Got a little uh, show and tell here for you. I want, want to make sure that the, the union guys in the back room can see this. They seem to think these proceedings are, are pretty funny. Uh, what, what we have here is a uh, chunk of tar sands. It's a tar ball that came out of the Kalamazoo River uh, five years after their catastrophic spill. So after, after a, more than a billion dollars was spent cleaning up the Kalamazoo River, uh, you can still find uh, you know, benzene-laden uh, uh, balls of toxic crud uh, like this uh, in that river. And so we want to uh, enter that as a, an, uh, an omission uh, to, uh, to the record. So I'm speaking against the revised uh, environmental impact statement. As a resident of Duluth, I want to take exception to what Senator Simonson said. Uh, he, perhaps he needs to travel in different circles, but I can assure you that uh, the people of Duluth are in no way convinced that our waterways will uh, be protected by uh, by the Line 3 project. I thought that the, uh, the failure to completely model the Lake Superior uh, watershed was a, was a gross uh, oversight. And 
Um, yes, we, we we can do without this in uh, in our lakes, in in our rivers, in our uh, in our estuary. And uh, I might label this uh, Enbridge's uh, credibility. And um, um, this was uh, loaned to me by Winona LaDuke, who I uh, believe you've met. And um, she couldn't be here today because of uh, your curious decision to uh, schedule this on top of the TEC meeting. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Shaw, and um, Linda Shaw ceded her time to me. So, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. My name is Michelle Shaw. I'm a teacher, and I live in Minneapolis. While I'm here as a part of Minnesota 350, more importantly, I'm here to stand up for my Native brothers and sisters in northern Minnesota, whose communities have already been torn apart by this pipeline. Those who have chosen to take a stand for their sacred food, cultural heritage, animals, plants, and water have been singled out and blacklisted on their respective Native nations, leaving them more destitute than they already were from our colonization. When I was in Fond du Lac last fall, I finally saw Enbridge's five pipeline corridor for myself. Nothing could have prepared me for seeing line four above ground in a wetland. The possibility of a leak into that water so real with the St. Louis River just a few miles to the east, both of which were outside the bounds of the final EIS. And nothing could prepare me for understanding the enormity of the danger one stray bullet could present if that pipeline was struck by a hunter. Calling this an environmental injustice is putting it lightly. Line three would never see the light of day if it was proposed to go through Edina, Wyzetta, or Woodbury. When you are driving through northern Minnesota and see those pipeline markers, I want you each to remember that the financial gains made by Enbridge are made at the expense of lives. Those pipeline markers represent the loss of our native people, our native cultures and languages, the very people you are supposed to be protecting. The question is this, will you uphold your mission as commissioners to create and maintain a regulatory environment that ensures safe, adequate, and efficient utility services? Line 3 itself has been the cause of the worst inland spill in the U.S. right here in Grand Rapids. In fact, when it happened on March 3, 1991, with oil flowing into the Prairie River, about 4 million gallons of oil had spilled from the pipeline in 16 incidents since the early 70s. That doesn't even take the last 20 years of spills and leaks into account, including the 2010 Kalamazoo River disaster. Please, I am urging you to say no to the FEIS. Say no to the permits and routes. Do your job and protect our public interest. Let Enbridge take care of itself. Hello, my name is Bonnie Beckel, spelled like it is on the screen. Um, I want to start by saying that I, I want to live in a Minnesota that can be resourceful about the need for jobs and not at the risk of our natural environment. Um, what Minnesota needs is green, clean energy. What Minnesota needs is a path to ending climate change and carbon being released into our atmosphere. Our Minnesota State Next Generation Energy Act calls for reductions in our emissions by 2050 to less than 35 million tons. That's, that's a great goal. Um, but this proposed pipeline alone, from oil extraction to burning, would amount to 193 million tons, which is five times the amount that we are aiming to reduce our emissions to in a whole year. We live in a society at a time of great change when we know we are doing things that are contributing to the death of our planet. And yet, we keep doing all these things. Isn't that a definition of insanity? Isn't that a definition of mental health neurosis? Robin Christensen this morning said, we're, we're hurtling toward extinction. The time is now for you, our leaders on the commission, to turn this around. Saying no to line three will write things in so many ways. 
listening to our indigenous relatives in Minnesota, honoring treaty rights, protecting the sacred waters we depend on for life, creating the fossil fuel-free future that we can all live with. Um, Senator Utke this morning doesn't seem to know that even the brand new portions of the Keystone Pipeline have had significant spills. And I, I just want to end by saying there are laws on the books that require us to protect our environment. And it, those laws don't give us the space to say, well, we've got other priorities. They just say, protect our environment. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you. My name is John Barnett as uh, spelled on the screen, thank you. Um, I do not work for Enbridge. I'm not a member of a trade union, and I don't stand to benefit in any in, you know, income way with the addition of the, the replacement of the pipeline. I'm here um, because this petition before the Public Utilities Commission has gone on for way too long, years. This is my first meeting here, my first visit to the Senate office building. And I'm doing so because it's been going on too long. Uh, for both, um, today we have heard lots of testimony from both sides, uh, from both the need to replace Line 3, as well as how important it is to uh, protect our lakes and streams and watersheds and our climate. Now it is time to acknowledge the certificate of need as it is stated and reaffirm the EIS of which one version was previously approved and finally approve the route permit, and here is why. My background is in metals. I know that welding technology today are far superior than that of 60 years ago. Process techniques, filler materials, and the optimization of heat affected zones. Clearly these technologies and others are exactly exactly what we need to protect the environment of the great state of Minnesota. And in doing so, would protect it for decades to come. Further, I'd like to add that the EIS is a document to inform us of potential risk uh, and impact. Preventative action is something different in, the, in this case it is achieved through the engagement of new technologies, new materials, and past lessons learned. So, as the agenda called, the action in the next days, as I see it, is to approve and make way for the Line 3 replacement project. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Andrew Tien, T-Y-A-N. Um, and I oppose the expansion of line three. I believe that one of the greatest threats to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. All of these talks revolve around a pipeline. Is it a pipeline for natural gas, a potentially cleaner, less polluting fossil fuel that enjoys more favorable support among moderate average Americans? No. Uh, is it just for like regular oil? No, it's for, it's for tar sands. It's a pipeline for the most polluting fossil fuel, like the, just the, the type of fossil fuel that no one has any good connotations about. It's, a, it's not a joke. You actually want to put in a pipeline for tar sands. I'm not an environmentalist, but to me, the only way this doesn't sound completely crazy is because maybe we've been heavily biased by the narrow scope of what's going on. You see that Wisconsin and Canada are already on board. Maybe it's too inconvenient to reject line three, that the immediate sense of disappointment would be too intense. Regardless of what you decide, my assumption is that most people will not remember you individually for the decisions made on this board. 
If it goes through in five years, it's likely they will only remember it as another example of powerful fossil fuel companies getting their way. And you will rationalize the decision by saying that it seemed like a sensible decision at the time. It's my hope that in the United States, we will, we will still not be collectively wait, waiting for the people with power to step up and save the environment and to actually start doing it. My name is Bruce O'Brien, and that is spelled correctly. Um, thank you for having uh, these uh, public hearings. I, um, this is my first time I've testified in this uh, kind of setting, and I uh, really appreciate it, and I've loved I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I appreciate being in this setting and listening to all of the testimony of others. Um, I am uh, a registered nurse. I'm retired now, but I have 45 years in the hospital setting. And in that 45 years, I have become an advocate. Uh, one is an advocate for their patient. You talk to the doctor about the patient's complaint or their symptoms or their whatever. Um, it's advocacy that still lives in me forever. I'm retired, I'm not in the hospital anymore, but I'm still an advocate for the most vulnerable among us. Um, and that includes the, um, the generations yet to come who um, will uh, wonder what this, these pipelines were all for. Uh, and uh, the, watching the climate uh, dissipate, it's, uh, it's can you hear me? This doesn't sound like it's right work. Okay. Um, I, I think um, I'm concerned about climate change because people are currently dying from climate change. So, um, but, um, you know, back in the 1850s, there was a treaty signed for the indigenous people of this state because we are on their land now. We got the land, they got the treaty, and at the time, that treaty was state of the art. Uh, and it's still good after all these years. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for your time today. My name is Lydia Macy, and I'm 19 years old. I have grown up in a generation that is terrified. We are terrified because we want the same exact things that you want, but people in power like yourselves have continuously made decisions that threaten our future. We, like every living person, every Minnesotan, regardless of whether or not we support pipelines, regardless of our political affiliation and ideologies, we just want clean water to drink, clean air to breathe, good jobs, and a future for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. Enbridge has convinced you that permitting this pipeline is your only choice, but it is not. This pipeline threatens each of these things for every person and exacerbates the, the effects of climate change immensely. Line three would cross the Mississippi River twice and threaten a number of wild rice lakes um, all, and according to Greenpeace, Enbridge pipelines leaks once every 20 days on average. All pipelines leak. Line three, if built, will leak into our water sources, contaminating the water that you and I rely on daily. No one is exempt from the effects of climate change. No one wants to live in climate catastrophe, and we do not have to. We are in a crucial moment where we can direct our future away from catastrophe and towards sustainability, health, and longevity. Right now, the stopping of this pipeline is your chance to protect our future and steer us away from catastrophe. 
Do you really want to tell your grandchildren that you did nothing to protect their future? Today, you have another chance, a second chance to make a decision that will deeply impact you and future generations to come. You must take this chance to rule the FEIS inadequate and deny all permits to line three. Thank you. I'm the name you just wiped off the screen. Fred Hage. First name F-R-E-D, last name H-A-G-E. I let ladies go first. I think I remember three of you commissioners from a building a year or two ago, and um, you're a few of the people in this room that hear both sides of the issues. You study it in depth, and you render a decision based on that input. I think you've gone like six or 10 or whatever it is, decisions in favor of Enbridge. Well, there's a reason why you did that. It's because it made sense. And uh, I'm for the pipeline. I've been to meetings on both sides. I've been to more meetings with Enbridge than on the other side. But I'm a 1949 model. I'm 70 years old, and I can remember life 60 years ago. And my life didn't change. The waters didn't change. The air didn't change. I've been in southern and northern Minnesota, and I just don't think the impact of the pipeline will change our children's or our grandchildren's lives. I know you speak of hydrocarbons and all that, but I don't know how many of you can think 60 years ago, but that's how old the pipeline is. And the pipelines have changed the technology. The wall of the new pipeline will be twice as thick. The welding's better as told by someone two or three previous before me here. And the sealant and insulation is better. The pipelines are built better now. I mean. That's the way it goes with each generation. We aren't using dial phones and buggy whips anymore. As time goes on, everything improves. And that's why I totally am in favor of your decisions already supporting Enbridge. And I know there's a good reason why you did vote that way. And I think the environment and commerce need to coexist responsibly. And um, in closing, I think an important statement is doing nothing is more risky and less safe than going ahead with the pipeline because you're risking an aging pipeline and that's, that's not as safe as putting a new one in. And it's not like the pipeline. Sir, your time is up. All right, thank you for your time. My name is Dwayne Peterson. I'm just, just an average uh, citizen that has been following this um, pipeline issue for a while and actually kind of lo lost track of all of the uh, convoluted uh, back and forth with courts and different um, inputs from different um, parts of our, of our government. And I know that uh, the same, same governor that appointed um, you to the chair, uh, Commissioner Sieben was was also also the one that um, you know continued the lawsuit to uh, to challenge the pipeline. So I'm it's, it's I'm frankly I've been confused about things, and and recently uh, some folks from from MN 350 um, were asking for participation and um, support for. Mm -hmm. For this uh, this forum and uh, and uh, other things, and I got a little bit more informed about things. Um, I guess this is this is ostensibly about reviewing the EIS. I think today, right? I, I don't know, but actually, it's not because the challenges that are, are being um, presented are 
larger than that. I think the, the message is that um, a lot of people feel st strongly about this, this issue to the point where resistance is not over today, right? I mean, if no matter what uh, you decide or what, what not. I frankly don't think that, that this issue belongs in front of the, the PUC at this point. Um, I think that the issue is, is larger in our um, society and I think our, our process, our government processes have maybe have failed us. I've, give, I've, I've given the same message to my, my state legislator and um, it seems like everybody else wants somebody else to take the, uh, the hit on this. Um, but, okay, I guess I'm done, but my message is that this is not a replacement project. Um, it's a new corridor. Uh, it's, it's, a larger, it's a larger pipe. If, if it was a replacement, I mean, maybe, maybe a case could be made. Um, but, you know, you're, you're going to have to step outside of the, the confines of your role to make a, a decision that's going to actually move this, this uh, forward in a way that makes sense. It does not make sense to build a new pipeline. No oil, no new infrastructure is the mantra across the world with and anybody that has any concern about environmental um, issues and, and climate change. So please step out of your role. I mean, I, I know you only have... Um, Sir, I think you need to wrap it up. All right, I'm done. Good afternoon, my name is Amy Sutherland and I'm just a concerned citizen that has sat through a lot of the PUC meetings in the past. And I thought, well, hell, I'll just go up and take a look at where this line is gonna go. So doing that, I've taken pictures and I've found that in fact, the, the first EIS is wrong. Looking at the survey that Mergent Company did for Enbridge, does not indicate there's any nests that I happen to see in these photographs. So I have a real problem with the original EIS. So I was real concerned about that and I went up to Duluth to the meeting up there and listened to people and I've listened to people here today too. And I really think you need to listen to people. I don't know that the EIS is the perfect document. I've found out it isn't. I'd love to take you up there and show you what I found if you're at all interested. Um, but I think your signing off on the certificate of need was affected by the aging current line three and its potential spills. Shouldn't you be required to consider potential spills all along the new corridor before you sign off on it? Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and, uh, and Commissioners. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify. Uh, uh, as uh, Juan Dale Loic, uh, uh, L-U-E-C-K, and spelled correctly. Uh, as one who served on our local county uh, planning and zoning commission for many years, in fact, I had the privilege or uh, uh, sometimes uh, not so fun job of chairing that, that commission. We. Uh, heard and, and dealt with a huge amount of uh, permits, everything from dog kennels to drilling for uh, doing copper nickel exploration. So understand the, uh, uh, the, the task before you. Uh, and I want to get right to that. Uh, my understanding is um, what you're looking at uh, based on what the court told you to do uh, was go back and look at the EIS specifically uh, with some changes or some, some additions to it. Um, I've looked at them myself. So I come from a world where I do read those uh, thousands and thousands of pages. Uh, and uh, my uh, look at that modeling, that additional modeling now that you've got in the, in the revised EIS is adequate. Um, so I would recommend clearly that uh, uh, we move forward, find that uh, uh, updated EIS adequate. Uh, and I would certainly recommend that we uh, reissue the certificate of need and the existing uh, route permit. And I, and I want to say um, I represent Aiken County, which I've got many, many uh, miles of that pipeline, new pipeline, and also uh, existing th uh, line three. And if we're really going to walk the walk on protecting the environment, then we need to replace that aging pipeline. 
that's what we owe our communities and our kids and the people in the future. And with that, uh, again, thank you for uh, your patience and uh, many years at working at this. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is uh, James Doyle. I am speaking uh, in place of Michelle Steffen, who, has, uh, who was up there earlier, and her name has been taken off uh, in her place. Yes, my name, uh, my name is uh, James Doyle, D-O-Y-L-E, and Michelle Steffen, S-T-E-F-F-A-N. I have a PhD in physics and do research in related areas, in energy-related areas, including computational modeling, and I wanted to draw attention to a number of deficiencies in the FEIS as I see it, as a scientific study, which I hope you agree should be the standard. Uh, and uh, I will not be able to get through this long list. I will refer you to my written comment for details and references. So for example, no consideration of the impacts, uh, of the impacts on groundwater contamination specific to the Lake Superior watershed was done, specifically into aquifers with hydrologic connection to Lake Superior. This is a major emission not consistent with the PUC order to look at the spills in the Lake Superior watershed. In fact, spill modeling did not consider penetration of oil through soil into an aquifer at all. Pinhole leaks in particular, because of detection difficulties, are capable of many times the oil spillage over time than a full bore rupture, were not also considered for the watershed itself. The possibility of overland spills resulting in soil entrainment en route to a water course where it can sink resulting in OPAs and oiled sediment on the watercourse bottom was not considered anywhere in the EIS. There was no modeling that considered the, res the response to a major oil spill in the Lake Superior watershed. There was one follow-up response study in the original EIS that looked at the quiescent waters of the Mississippi River at Palisades. Response is particularly problematic with regard to suspended oil and oil sediment. Even Dr. Horn of RPS and his uh, testimony for the PUC said that the response would be quite different uh, in turbulent waters with regard to OPA, forma OPA formation. Oil sediment and OPA formation is what resulted in the Enbridge Line 6B spill in the 2010 Marshall, Michigan, requiring over five years of cleanup and over a billion dollars in cost. According to the modeling, significant suspended oil and oil sediment will very likely occur in the St. Louis River. Sir, your time is up. I will just finish by saying, commissioners, this is really a minimal, perfunctory study. It would never pass muster in a pure scientific review. And how much more important is this study than the vast majority of scientific papers that I've read uh, or even, even written? Good afternoon, and thank you for the work that you are doing. It is incredibly important. My name is Patricia Torres Ray. I'm a state senator. I represent Senate District 63 in the Minnesota Senate. And I am here to voice the concerns of many people in my district and many people around the state of Minnesota who work with me to pass the bill that will hopefully bring some recommendations about how to address a significant problem impacting indigenous women in the state of Minnesota, the country, and actually Canada as well, which is the missing and murdered indigenous women. What we learned through this process is that these areas where the pipeline will be built are areas that are heavily impacted by violence. And I want to share with you a personal experience that I really want you to review. I was born in Colombia, South America, where this problem has taken place for generations now. And many indigenous people are being displaced from the land, where the land has been poisoned and the water has been poisoned because of this industry. I have said to so many people in my district and people around the country and people in Colombia that we need to unite to protect the lives of these people 
in this area, of our people in the area. I want you to please pay attention to that and the impact that this will have on wild rice in the area as well as the indigenous people who have been working to protect the land for generations. I am very grateful for the participation of the Indian communities on this issue and I want to let you know that I am going to be working with them today in the future and for as long as, as I can to protect the land and the water in this area and that I oppose this and I want you to review that very carefully because we are not going away. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. If your name is on the list, please come forward uh, and state your comments. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Joel Fowler, and I'm speaking uh, for Mike Racky, who uh, ceded his time to me. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to sit here and listen to all of us, uh, both for and against the pipeline. I don't envy you in your positions, but I do want to implore you to uh, base your decision on facts and reaffirm your decision on facts, uh, not opinion. Um, and the facts of the matter are, uh, the old pipeline is a bigger risk than installing a new pipeline. The union trades, men and women of the laborers, the UA, the operators and the Teamsters are some of the best and most highly trained, skilled craftsmen and women in the country, and nobody will build a safer pipeline than we will. We get the work, whether it's an integrity and maintenance dig because we need to do the maintenance on an aging pipeline or whether we're installing the new pipeline. I would much rather have a safer environment and install a new pipeline that has much less of a chance of taking us or spilling oil than I would repairing or replacing or doing environmental remediation on one that we know is already going to have some problems in the future. I'm also uh, own a second uh, property up near uh, where this is going through that I use recreationally for fishing and hunting. I'm an advocate. Uh, for environmental cleanliness. I live on a lake and I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to enjoy the outdoors just like they should be able to right now. I don't believe this is going to impact uh, the carbon footprint because Enbridge is not a uh, power company. They're a midstream developer. The oil that it is shipping has already been pumped. Nobody's going to turn off their heat in the middle of the winter and shut off the natural gas the fuel oil, or shut off the lights for the electricity that the power generation makes. There is a false narrative going around that the technology has advanced to a point that we can switch to 100% renewable resources by flipping a switch. That is not the case. The laborers advocate for an all-the-above energy policy, and that includes installing and construction, constructing wind farms. The fact is, there is not enough transmission available in the state of Minnesota to be able to build enough wind farms to supply the amount of electricity that we need to do what we need. So again, I ask, please reaffirm your previous vote, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you. My name is Joe Fowler, J-O-E-F-O-W-L-E-R. Afternoon. My name is uh, Lucas Franco, and Tony Wicken ceded his time to me. Uh, yep, it's L U C A S F R A N C O. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, I'm the research manager for the Laborers Union of Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, we represent about 13,000 trades women and men across those two states. Uh, I grew up on a small organic farm. My mom's family have farmed for generations in northern Minnesota. Myself and our members care deeply about the environment and addressing climate change. We, the laborers, want to reduce our state's carbon footprint and make Minnesota a national leader in addressing climate change. Stopping this project is not an effective way to address our climate crisis. In fact, it'll only make things worse. I've heard and read many misinterpretations of the carbon emission data in the FEIS that assume capacity of the pipeline represents additional consumption even though the record shows that is not true. No one is going to go out and buy a Humvee just because we approve this project. Demand for oil is high, 
Stopping this pipeline will not stop that demand. Instead, it'll force the same oil to move by truck or rail, and these methods spill 25 to 50 times more oil by volume. This pipeline is the most environmentally friendly and safest means to move oil to market. Stopping it will only make our climate crisis worse. Instead of investing endless energy and resources on stopping this pipeline, let's work together to effectively reduce demand. We, the laborers, are at the forefront of fighting to address climate change. I spend the vast majority of my time fighting hard with our members, other unions, and community allies to advocate for bold investments in new wind and solar across the state, to build new light rail to dramatically reduce our use of fossil fuel in the metro, and working to pass clean energy first to make Minnesota a national leader in reducing uh, our carbon. We're fighting for real so solutions to climate change like clean energy first. And I hope that many in this room will join us in that fight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Audrey Arquin, A-D-R-I-A-R-Q-U-I-N, and I was seated time by Mariana Hefta. We've heard a lot of arguments today about the economic reasons for having a pipeline. But as is shown in many cases, switching to a green economy is actually the best thing for our environment. If fossil fuels were the future and if those markets were strong, why would we see companies like BlackRock, one of the largest investment firms in the world, joining the Climate 100 movement? They know that the future of our economy is in green energy, and they know that the future of this country has to be a transition to a green economy. And while this issue is poised as an economic one, the issue is strengthened for the youth of this country. This issue of building a pipeline shows the difference between focusing on what will happen in the next five years and focusing on our future. The issue of climate change affects my generation the most, and we are the most at risk if you choose to build this pipeline. This is an issue that we need to stand up against and that we need to do in order to survive. My generation needs you to stand up because we are unable to do it ourselves at this moment. We need you to guarantee that we will still be able to live on this planet in 50 years. And by doing that, you need to start today by not approving this pipeline measure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Christine Popowski, and I am speaking for Derek Shaw. Everyone knows all pipelines leak. This proposal would put two lines through the Mississippi headwaters. When, not if, the pipeline leaks, that would affect our drinking water, which comes from the Mississippi River. I, for one, do not want to drink oil-flavored water. It doesn't taste good, and it's not good for your health. It would also affect all the cities and states down the Mississippi River. For this reason and many others, I'm asking you to reject line three. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nicholas Kedrowski, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S-K-E-D-R-O-W-S-K-I. I've been listening to a lot of the different testimony that's been provided, or opinion, whatever. I was on kind of the other side of the fence from what I'm going to say today uh, for quite a bit of my life. Uh, I don't work for Enbridge. I'm not an employee. But I do trainings in Native American communities here in, in Minnesota. Uh, we do empowerment trainings. Our trainings are designed to try to help improve outcomes and futures for tribal members. Uh, one of the things that we teach them is critical thinking. We ask them to take a look at both sides of everything, think about them critically, and come to their own conclusions. I don't tell people pipelines are great. I don't tell them that they're, they're bad. I just tell them the information I have discovered through my own research. Uh, I taught myself about pipeline issues because of the communities that I work in. Uh, it was important for me to know those issues. Enbridge is not a fuel company. 
They transport over 80 different types of oils in line three. They create everything from fuels to plastics, uh, all of the products that basically most of us use in our everyday lives. Switching to an electric vehicle, I myself have a hybrid. Uh, I enjoy the fact that I use very little fuel. I kind of brag about it sometimes even. Uh, but my vehicle only does that because it's made primarily out of plastic, which is derived from petroleum. So to think that you can flip a switch and get rid of fossil fuels uh, is literally sticking your head in the sand. We need to buy time in order to develop those additional technologies. So what I'm asking that this body do is to approve line three so we can, you can buy us the time to develop those technologies. We need that additional time so the existing line three, which will leak, we all know that, can be replaced with something that will be more sustainable. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Eleanor Dvorak. I live in Minnetonka. I've lived in Minnesota most of my life. And I'm 63, and it was a lot colder when I was a kid than it is now in the winter. Um, I asked the PC to rule that at, at the FES, FEIS falls short and is inadequate and to deny any more Line 3 permits. The changes to the FEIS were meant to address risks to water. We all need clean water to live, and the PUC must set a high priority to protect Lake Superior, the Lake Superior watershed, some of Minnesota's cleanest lakes and rivers, and the headwaters of the 2,300-mile-long Mississippi River. The new Line 3 route previously approved by the PUC would cross the Mississippi Headwaters twice and threaten many of the cleanest lakes in Minnesota, including lakes where the Ojibwe grow wild rice that is sacred and integral to their culture. The additional analysis done in the FEIS was only on one location, which made the analysis overly narrow and flawed in the lack of consideration for other locations and for the failure to include an ecological risk assessment. The tar sands that Edinburgh wants to pass from Minnesota via Line 3 is some of the dirtiest oil in the world and the, mo the virtually impossible to clean when it spills into lakes and rivers. Oil spills are statistical reality pipelines, and Edinburgh is clearly no exception. They have a history of spills, and, and including an explosion in 2007 at the Clearbrook Terminal that spilled 15,000 gallons of oil and killed two workers. The age of the existing pipeline, 3, appears to be a factor in the PUC's initial decision in 2018 to approve the new Line 3. However, the age of the pipelines was not a factor at Clearbrook. To quote the Minnesota Department of Transportation findings regarding the cause of the Enbridge terminal explosion, quote, Enbridge procedure 0603-13 was not followed during the installation of the fitting involved in the accident, and interviews conducted with Enbridge personnel across its pipeline system indicated that these procedures had not been followed consistently for a number of years, unquote. Further, I ask the PUC to consider that the Keystone Pipeline is also a relatively new pipeline, yet it had two very large spills in just two years, including one in 2019. Ma'am, so, your time is up. If you could wrap oh, up. OK. Please. Um, I just ask you to protect our water and honor treaty rights and deny the permit and certificate of need to Route 3. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Trang Do has ceded her time to me. My name is Claire Stoshek, C-L-C-L-A-I-R-E-S-T-O-S-C-H-E-C-K. And this is my 11-month-old daughter, Luna. Louder? Okay, sorry. This is kind of far away. <laughs> um, so I, my name is Claire, and this is my 11-month-old daughter, Luna. Uh, we live in Minneapolis. Today I will be presenting on behalf of Luna and others of her generation, as they cannot speak for themselves yet. Um, and Luna wants to ask you to uh, look inside of your hearts and ask, will this pipeline truly benefit more people than it will harm? And is it worth it? And we think in this age of climate crisis and water that is um, being contaminated that the answer is clearly a no. Uh, Luna and her peers, deserve a future with clean water, a stable climate, and healthy wild rice? And would you deny them all of that for the short-term benefit of a few? This, this pipeline would worsen the climate crisis, threaten water supplies, and disproportionately impact indigenous communities. And it is not needed. We do have clean energy alternatives. 
And so we are here today to say that the revised FEIS is not adequate. The PUC, please, should deny both the certificate of need and the routing permit and any future permits for this project. And yeah, Luna just wants to say, please just look her in the eye and let her know that you are thinking of her when you make these decisions and her peers and thinking um, about the, the future that they will have and their right to clean water, clean air, and a stable climate. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Kugler, and Deborah George has traded her time to me. Uh, I am a research scientist with the University of Minnesota, and I have two daughters, ages nine and almost six. And I'm here today on their behalf and on behalf of the children and grandchildren of everyone in this room and around the world. I want our children to grow up in a world where they can pursue their dreams and raise their own families, not a world thrown into chaos by an increasingly unstable climate. In order to ensure a safer world, we must stop building fossil fuel infrastructure now. The EIS for Line 3 is not adequate because it rests on a huge and deeply flawed assumption. The EIS takes Enbridge at its word that the oil that will flow through this pipeline must be moved. It goes through the exercise of evaluating the environmental impact of the pipeline only relative to other modes of moving the oil. It does not seriously consider the environmental impacts of extracting, transporting, and burning the oil relative to leaving it in the ground and finding other ways to reduce and meet our energy needs. Despite the lack of serious consideration, the EIS does contain one figure that should tell you all you need to know, the staggering $287 billion social cost of the carbon burning in this oil. Perhaps that number got lost because it's just one number in a 13,000 page document. But it will be measured not truly in dollars, but in burning forests and flooding homes and failing harvests. Over the past few years, as this decision-making process has played out, the climate scientist, science has become ever clearer and more alarming. We now know unequivocally that we have only about 10 years to drastically cut carbon emissions or face catastrophic consequences. Cutting emissions to the extent required is utterly incompatible with constructing an oil pipeline that will continue to carry dirty tar sands oil for 40 to 60 years. For the sake of my children, your children, and life on earth, please deny the certificate of need and the route permit. Thank you. Hello, I'm Deborah K. Andreessen, and I'm in Michelle Shaw's place, um, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, the initial K dot, and then A-N-D-R-E-S-E-N. And it's recently, you know, we're all kind of looking in the ground, at the, and somebody said to, um, to look up at the atmosphere. And the atmosphere, I, I recently became aware, is only 10 miles high. And I, that's about the distance from Minneapolis to St. Paul. And so think about all the pollution and the exhaust and everything that just goes up into that 10 miles. And just that kind of gives a whole different picture and that, that pollution stays in there a long, long time, you know, way beyond my lifetime. I can't remember what the, the exact amount is. And... Um, you know, like it keeps. I think it needs to be reiterated that um, even though we've worked, I've worked hard over the decades to reduce, you know, our my carbon footprint and all of that. Um, this and get rid of the coal-fired power plant, you know, power plants and all that, and work for renewables. This tar sands is going to put the, the equivalent of ten coal-fired power plants into the atmosphere. And this world is changed by movements, mass movements. History is changed by movements. And the environmental movement is really taking off. It's huge to the point that it's, a, you, know, uh, you know, there's student movements and it's gone way beyond even BlackRock, the investment. You know, that's, 
he doesn't want to, they don't want to support fossil fuels anymore. They want to invest in sustainability. Also today, Jim Cramer from CNBC, Mad Money, he's a former stockbroker and hedge fund manager. He says, I'm done with fossil fuels. And um, if you go into the Oil and Energy Insider, they're talking about how, how the, um, oh, the, the finances of a lot of the big oil and energy companies are going down. Um, so that's a problem. I think the world has changed in 60 years. And I, I think it's serious. And I, you know, um, I talk to the people at Enbridge, and I care about them. Already? Wow, I thought I had more time on Jeopardy. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and distinguished judges. Uh, thank you for letting me speak at this hearing again. I've been to, uh, spoke I believe four times so far in favor and approval of the Line 3 project. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Matthew Gordon. Um, I sit on the advisory board of the Minnesotans for Line 3 and we have turned in over 7,000 approved comments on this issue. I am an enrolled member of the White Earth Nation. I am also a small business owner located in Northwest Minnesota in Minoman County. I am here in support for the Line 3 project. I've spoken several times and attended several meetings over the last four years. In the past few years, Gordon Construction has worked on several projects for Enbridge. We have called by some people the preferred native contractor from Enbridge. That was supposed to be a disparaging comment against our company. Um, I look at it as a badge of honor because this comp I am proud to work for a company that is the highest safety, environmental, and quality assurance programs in the industry today. Emerge has been working with the indigenous tribes such as White Earth, are the businesses of White Earth and the people of White Earth for training. Um, for, to prepare for the construction of the Line 3 project. <clears throat> the construction of the Line 3 projects, they have engaged in training, cultural monitoring inspection, and empowerment and safety training with the unions and other private entities to ensure the Line 3 will be installed safely, correctly, and environmentally sound. As a Native American and a small business owner in Minnesota who pays taxes, and owns land in northern Minnesota, I approve and support the replacement of Line 3. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing us, the community, to speak. And this is my first opportunity speaking for this, this uh, commission. My name is Joan Hahn, and according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have already warmed the planet by one C's. So if 1.5 to 2 C's is our goal, that puts us in a very constrained carbon budget. Therefore, we need to keep the tar sands oil in the ground, not build a pipe dream that becomes climate disaster and that becomes a disaster for the indigenous people of this land. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Russell from Minneapolis. The Minnesota Court of Appeals ruled that the EIS was inadequate because it failed to address the impact of an oil spill on the Lake Superior watershed. The document that you now have before you does not answer that question, offering instead lots of technical details that never really get to a point. As one example, I would challenge you to reread EIS Chapter 10 on the accidental crude oil releases. Just read the blueprint, the new stuff. There's really no useful information there to assess um, what's going on. And it's symbolic of my experience with the Line 3 process. You've generated a flood of documents but what they have in volume, they lack in real clarity to the public to understand um, the harms that are going to result from this project. You've heard from people saying this is the most studied pipeline uh, in history, but this isn't this is about a participation trophy where just because you do the project or write the EIS that you have to say yes. This information is really quite dense, technical, and opaque. 
um, just basically, the, the PUC hasn't provided even a basic narrative of how you weighed the line three costs and benefits and came to your decision, or even stated what the public purpose is. And from my viewing and listening, it seems like the public purpose is jobs. And if jobs is the goal, I think that debate should be had. I support good living wage jobs for Minnesotans. And I think there are cheaper ways to do it than approving a project that will create $287 billion in climate damage. That's a huge cost that those news jobs are placing on really poor people all across the planet. Many young people have uh, slogged through the volumes of testimony, texts, and appendices. They've engaged in the subject matter at a very deep level, beyond what should have been required had this been put in an understandable way. Uh, they participated in the administrative law judge's process and watched as you ignored the ALJ's conclusion that this project's costs outweigh its benefits. You ignored the Department of Commerce's findings that Enbridge failed to show the project was needed. You dismissed the EIS climate change analysis, and you ignored treaty rights. After all that, you choose to accept Enbridge's optimistic spill response times. This in spite of Enbridge's track record on spill responses. You are looking at line three through oil-covered glasses, unable to see clearly the real harm that's right in front of us. I agree with the previous speaker. This has gone on for too long. You need to say no to line three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. My name is Julia Evelyn, J-U-L-I-A-E-V-E-L-Y-N, and I'm speaking on behalf of A.G. Arquin. I'm a college student in St. Paul, and I've lived here for a little over three years now, and in this time, what I've come to love about Minnesota is how much Minnesotans care, truly care about people, about our climate and clean air and water, and this is why it's totally inconceivable to me that we could even consider allowing a new pipeline that will add 193 million tons of CO2 to our atmosphere, or that risks over 200 water bodies, including the Mississippi River, which is where so many of us get our drinking water. I could give you more facts about how the EIS is inadequate, but honestly, I think that the scientists in this room have so eloquently stated it, and I don't need to. What I want to tell you is that I'm 22 years old, and I expect that I will live longer than many of the people in this room. I, along with the other young people who have spoken, along with your children and grandchildren, will be dealing with the disastrous effects of the climate crisis long after you are gone. Permitting this pipeline is a slap in my face. It tells me, and it tells your children and grandchildren, that you don't care about our futures or our ab ability to live in a clean and healthy world. The world is changing, and it's long past time for our policies to change with it. We need green and clean energy solutions rather than more oil infrastructure. I urge you to be leaders in that change. Reject this FEIS, reject the certificate of need, reject the root permit, and use the power that you have been given to make this a better world. Hi, um, my name is Isabel Green, um, it's right up there. I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm 20 years old. I was gonna talk about climate change, uh, but you've heard a lot about the impacts of climate change today. Um, you know about climate change, you live on this earth, um, you see it every day. The Amazon is burning, California is burning, Australia is burning. Um, it's not a debate. This isn't something you need to be told anymore. Um, I feel it every day. I've heard a couple of older people talk about how the, the world is warmer than it was when they were kids. The world is warmer than it was when I was a kid, um, and I'm 20 years old. Um, it's getting faster. Um, also, there's no such thing as a safe pipeline. They all leak. It's, it's gonna leak. Um, and even if it didn't, it would still be shipping 50 new coal power plants worth of carbon dioxide that will be burned and put into the atmosphere and make the world less safe for all of us in the future. We have to leave this oil in the ground. Um, it's the only way to prevent like catastrophic climate change. 
um, impacts and um, and if the pipeline isn't built, the oil will stay in the ground. Um, and I, I guess the only other thing I want to say is that um, this decision is completely in your power right now and you have the power to just stop this from happening in like one decision and I don't understand why you wouldn't use that to the best of your ability um, to, yeah, say no to the pipeline and maintain indigenous treaties and make the future less scary for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Claire Stochek has ceded her time to me. My name is S-H-E-A-P-E-E-P-L-E-S. Thank you for listening to us all day. It sounds like a very long day. Um, more and more of us as a species are just beginning to understand what we can accomplish together in the direction of healing the earth and treating each other well, meeting our needs and having good lives. We are all miraculous beings with unlimited ingenuity. We are so fortunate to exist together on this wondrous planet. It is possible to think with our hearts and solve the problems we've created. The only true intelligence involves our hearts and engages our caring for our world, our non-human allies and one another. This is not incompatible with a functional economic system. Our current economic system, based as it is on earth damaging habits, is incompatible with us. If you permit line three, you will be supporting an unworkable system. I do not believe, if you permit line three, that you will be thinking with your hearts. You will also be underestimating the power of our wonderful species to meet our economic needs within the requirements of our beautiful home, just at a time when a critical mass of us are comprehending how to do this and how great it can be. Please do not permit line three. Thank you. Sir, you're welcome to go if your name is on the list. Commissioners, my name is Jerry Striegel, and it's, uh, it's spelled correctly. <clears throat> The real-time climate experiment we are running is yielding painful results in Minnesota and around the world, with nothing but the promise of misery tomorrow. On some level, you know it. Uh, in the short block of time since Enbridge made application, you have witnessed the rapid ramping up of catastrophic natural events, <clears throat> both in terms of frequency and severity. This proposal drives emissions in the wrong direction. And what for? To provide Alberta's toxic goo with a path to ports unknown. As this commission well knows, Xcel Energy has announced plans to decommission its remaining Minnesota coal-fired plants. Great. Xcel expects to conclude all four closures by 2030. In the meantime, you are toying with the prospect of introducing this absurd infrastructure, and with it, <coughs> adding the equivalent emissions of 50 coal-fired plants. Unbelievable. <coughs> As you prepare to make your decision this coming week, I'll remind you of some recent events. A regulatory body and an engineering firm succumbed to lax certification design misrepresentation and engineering shortcuts. Boeing gambled 
the FAA didn't catch it, and 346 people perished. The horrific loss incurred in those two 737 MAX crashes pales. It pales in comparison to the losses resulting from failure to address climate change. How much risk are you going to sign us up for? Reject the EIS and deny the permits. It's time for Minnesota to be part of solutions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, board members, and thank you for your time. My name is Representative Matt Grossel. We got District 2A uh, by Clearbrook. Uh, Cheryl Grover ceded her time to me. My name is spelled M-A-T-T-H-E-W, last name G-R-O-S-S-E-L-L. -S -S -E I'm going to uh, read something from another representative who is also a White Earth Band member. Right, uh, for four years, Minnesotans have, had their, have held their breath as they watch the rail cars roll through their communities. The trains travel over taxed rails, at times unable to exceed 30 miles per hour for fear of derailing. People in small towns are dealing with uh, trains moving through every 20 minutes. It is neither convenient nor safe. Many believe it is only a matter of time before someone is, is hurt or killed. The chance of a train, de train derailing has local folks on edge. The efforts of a few uh, to stop oil has only made the movement of the oil greater risk Minnesota, to Minnesotans and to the environment. The pipeline, as you, have, as you have studied, as you have learned over these past four years, and for many years, is the safest way to transport oil across the country, across the state. The economic benefit of the pipeline cannot be overlooked. As I'm uh, reading this, I'm reading this for Representative Steve Green. The economic benefit, um, he is a member of the White Earth Band. Replacement of the aging uh, Line 3 is a great opportunity to advance the financial condition of tribal members across Minnesota, as stated by Mr. Gordon earlier. Local small businesses stand to benefit as well. The training of future pipeline employees will give experience uh, that will benefit not just uh, in the job, but the careers. Careers that uh, will offer Monthly wages equal to six months average income for the area that he lives in. Increased property tax revenue will also support schools, county services, uh, your, your emergency services, etc. So I give my time to Representative Green. Thank you for your work and continue to do your job. You've done it uh, many times. You've made many good decisions. I don't see where anything has changed yet. You've heard all the same stuff already. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Wolf. My name was up there previously, but it's spelled S A R A W O L F F. Thank you so much for having this opportunity to hold this hearing to hear from the public. Um, I was at some of the hearings that were held back in June of 2018. And I really want to say that I appreciate that this commission was coming from a place of protecting public safety when it made the decision that it did back in June of 2018. I'd also like to say that the context has changed. Information has become available that you did not have then when you made that decision. It was two months later in September of 2018 that the International Panel on Climate Change came out with their report that said, in order to stave off the most devastating consequences, we needed to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030 and entirely by 2050. That information, that scientific goalpost had not been put on the ground yet but at, until that point. And the other report that came out was two months after that, November of 2018, an 11 agency report from the US federal government that said climate change is happening and it's having real consequences across the economies in the country.
The risks to Lake Superior from line three are twofold, spills in the watershed and also increased climate crisis from emissions generated by the oil carried by this pipeline. These risks are interrelated and they compound each other. And this is not always adequately reflected in the EIS. The warming climate is changing the water cycles. In other words, we have extreme weather events. And these extreme weather events erode infrastructure, roads, bridges, utilities, pipelines, making them more susceptible to spills. These changing water cycles are also straining our fresh water resources. Even without the increased emissions consequences from line three, the greatest threat to Lake Superior, that ecosystem, and the resource to the people who rely on it is the climate crisis. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. We're going to take a five minute recess right now. Since there are three of us, we can't get up and just use the facilities. So five minute recess, please, we'll, be, uh, we'll start right now. Folks, we have about 50 minutes left, so let's, uh, if you see your name on the list, please come to the front seat so you can efficiently get to the microphone when the speaker in front of you is done speaking. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Patricia Curlum, who's sick and has released her time to me. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting us to speak to you today, Commissioner Sugar and Tuma. Thank you for listening to us. My name is Jamie Gaither, J-A-M-I-G-A-I-T-H-E-R. I live in Elida, um, and I'm here in part at the direction of my Ojibwe sister, Dawn Goodwin, who has sent me with this beautiful DNR handbook about the place where... Little oh, I usually am really loud. Trust me. <laughs> Should I start over? Okay, so um, I'm here at the direction in part of uh, Dawn Goodwin, an Ojibwe sister who lives in this um, Chippewa Plains area with me. And this is an area that is rich in diversity with three biomes coming together, the prairie, the deciduous forest, and the coniferous forest. We have over 200 species of birds and over 60 species of mammals. And I'm here in part because I know that those entities, those relatives cannot come be here to speak in your room today. Um, I am glad to have this opportunity, even though, as we see, um, the TEC happening at White Earth Nation today has prohibited our indigenous relatives in large part from being here with us today. Um, and as I understand it, this is really important for you. The last time you did this was with um, the Sandpiper Project in 2014, which Enbridge subsequently abandoned. Um, and at that time, the public was able to enlighten you about your predecessors, actually, um, about some very critical things. As a matter of fact, I heard there were audible gasps by the commissioners when Friends of the Headwaters put up a map showing the route and the many, many water bodies that it would cross in, in our northern Minnesota region. And that's in part because the initial routes that were provided by Enbridge didn't even include the Mississippi River. So the public is gonna potentially give you a lot of information today. I'm sure you've heard a great deal of understanding. And I would, I would talk to you more about, you know, I live in, in Bear Creek Township. We have one creek that runs through our township. And it's, uh, you know, you can guess what it's called. Oh, seriously, are you kidding me? Well, I really wanted to speak. You see, did you see the papers that I left for you about the Enbridge spills? I know a lot of people have talked about spills, but in reality, Enbridge has done really well for the last decade, and, and mostly in part because of these wonderfully skilled workers and these new weld techniques. We really need to just keep using this line that we've got. We cannot afford to build new fossil fuel infrastructure, but we can support a lot of jobs with maintenance and monitoring of this current line three. Thank you for your consideration. Good afternoon. What a wonderful way to spend Friday. Um, my name is Tom Watson. I'm the immediate past president and director emeritus of the Whitefish Area Property Owners Association, otherwise known as WAPOA, located in northern Crow Wing County. Uh, to contrast to a gentleman who was here earlier, I'm a 1945 model. So I've been around a few years. Um, 
And I want to provide you with uh, some direct information that uh, you asked for in the um, information that you supplied uh, as to three questions. Is the EIS adequate? The answer is it's not. And I'm going to give you some reasons why it's not. Um, the particular analytical work that was done um, failed in to recognize that the Court of Appeals order offered you a direction that said they wanted to look at the analysis as it impacted Lake Superior watershed, lowercase w, or Lake Superior and its watershed. There is no such thing as a Lake Superior watershed. There's a Lake Superior basin. The Lake Superior basin consists of about six or seven watersheds, some along the North Shore, the largest being the St. Louis River, the Namaji River that you know about, and there are a couple watersheds along the south shore of Lake Superior in northern Wisconsin. I think the Court of Appeals wanted you to look at not just an impact on Lake Superior, but also wanted you to look at the watersheds surrounding Lake Superior, watersheds, capital W, plural, which would extend to the Mississippi River watershed to the west, which would be west of Fond du Lac to which there is a pipeline proposed to go through that entire area. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Number two, there is nothing about the socioeconomic impacts required in an EIS for the spill analysis itself. What does it do to that environment? What does it do to employment? What does it do to the small business owner in the area in Carleton? What does it do to the small farmer in the area? What does it do to the timber producer in the area? Etc. There is no information in this document about that. Sir, your time's up. The very last comment I want to make, if I can do that. Enbridge in December of 2014 introduced us to this whole matter when Sandpiper came along. And they basically told all of us in north central Minnesota that there would be no concern about spills to watersheds. I'm in a half a million acre watershed called the Pine Sir, River Watershed. It's time and to wrap it up. And the fact of the matter is, their subcontractor, namely Bar Engineering, came back and told us, oh, incidentally, there could be impacts Sir, to three lakes. Sir, you need to stop talking of Which is our You're lake. You're impeding on other people's ability to comment. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. My name is Joey Sanders. I'm uh, taking Joe Fowler's time. Um, my name is Sterling Sanders, like I said, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G-S-A-N-D-E-R-S. -E uh, I don't have a PhD. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm a laborer. Um, I, uh, pertaining to a few comments I heard before, uh, being a temporary job, I've made a 15-year career of temporary jobs. I'm a single father two beautiful children um, that have health insurance. Um, every job out there, when it comes to the trades, is a temporary job. Every time we go to work, we work ourselves out of a job. This building was a temporary job for many, many trades and crafts people. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. <laughs> Members of the Public Utilities Commission, my name is Wendy Ulrich. I have spelled up above. Um, for three years, I volunteered with Minnesota 350, the climate justice organization. Um, I'm going to start by commenting on this final version, a revised version of the EIS, uh, which I find inadequate because it seems to be written without understanding and addressing the nature of watershed. That water and contaminants coming from multiple bodies of water and streams flow from there downstream, converging and emptying into the basin, in this case, Lake Superior. The revised final EIS doesn't acknowledge that what water substances and contaminants are in the whole of the watershed affect the lake. The Lake Superior Basin has several secondary watersheds, the St. Louis River watershed being the one that factors in uh, for us today. Um, an example of a portion of this watershed is that of the St. Louis River, um, or as it approaches Lake Superior, it forms a large freshwater estuary 
called the Lake Superior or St. Louis River Estuary. This estuary with its diverse plant, animal, and marine life as part of the St. Louis River watershed um, should be protected from contamination of a Line 3 tar sands oil spill. Continuing the operation of Line 3 here represents a double whammy of huge risks for our environment. First, a pipeline spill in this watershed risks the waters of Lake Superior, the largest body of fresh water in the world, one that will become more and more important when, with time. Secondly, it is critical that we immediately change fossil fuel usage to turn around the climate crisis we are in. The Minnesota Department of Commerce has recommended that the oil transported in Line 3 is not needed in Minnesota and our region. Our state and the Anishinaabe tribal lands and waters simply serve as a risky conduit area for others' pipeline of profit. During um, this time of increasing awareness of climate changes, it is counterintuitive and environmental suicide to commit to upgrade flow volume and use a fossil fuel tar sands pipeline that has a future life of 60 years when we need to dramatically globally reduce CO2 emissions over the next 11 years to avoid reaching the tipping point of no return, continuing climate chaos. There are many reasons for the PUC to decline Enbridge's replacement Ma pipeline. Ma'am, your time is up. Just a couple more sentences. In this writing, I emphasize the need to take definite and dramatic action to stave off climate crisis and to honor the 1855 treaty between the federal government and our Anishinaabe neighbors, saving the sensitive wild rice lakes and granting the right to hunt fish and gather in their ceded lands, degrading these areas with environmental damage caused by traversing oil pipelines and inevitable spills is not honoring If people the aren't going to be respectful of the two-minute timeline, you just need to understand that there are still a number of cards that haven't been pulled, and so you're just inhibiting others' abilities to give their comments. So please be respectful of the two-minute time. Thank you. Alan Richardson ceded his time to me. It looks like he was taken off just recently. Uh, my name is Wendy Carlson, W-E-N-D-Y-C-A-R-L-S-O-N. I come from an environmental background, and I spent all of 2014 going around the state, meeting with drinking water providers to figure out what it was that was hindering them from providing safe, affordable drinking water to Minnesota. Pipelines have posed a major issue in Minnesota, and it's these risks that we're looking at are something that the public is still working to clean up in different areas. This is an antiquated system that I don't believe we need. Um, the risks to the environment if this pipeline goes through will have lasting impacts. And you already know this. You already know the data. Everybody here has been talking about the data all day and the reasons that this, that this should be opposed. I, by not listening to these concerns, we're, we're going to push that burden onto future generations, and that's simply just not acceptable. Um, I would encourage you to find the FEIS in inadequate and listen to the people that have taken their time to come here and talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is, sorry. Hi, my name is Abby Hornberger. My time was ceded to me today by, I believe, Margaret Green. Uh, can you say that all over again? Yeah, so my name is Abby Hornberger, um, spelled A-B-B-Y-H-O-R-N-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E my time was ceded to me today by, I believe, Margaret Green. I think I'm remembering that correctly. Um, I am here today as a student at the University of Minnesota, and through my education and personal activities and interests, I have grown very concerned about the extension of the Line 3 pipeline on indigenous land and through major connected waterways that are essential to Minnesota's ecological health. I believe that the FEIS does not provide an adequate ev evaluation of the great risks and damage that building um, the Line 3 pipeline would have on both Minnesota as a state and the country at large. The PUC should not grant further permits to the Enbridge Energy to build the proposed tar sands pipeline. You need to deny the certificate of need and route permit because this pipeline would unnecessarily further our society's dependence on fossil fuels. And while it is not a switch, it is not on and off, we are building the way and finding a way to create a more green economy. 
Um, according to Minnesota's Department of Commerce, the pipeline isn't necessary to meet energy needs and would therefore force us to ne needlessly rely on dangerous fossil fuel energy rather than furthering transitions to clean energy. Additionally, this pipeline is a climate justice issue and the construction of the pipeline interferes with indigenous people's rights to hunting, fishing, and gathering on their land as stated in the 1855 treaty. The impact of pipeline workers on the land um, and li livelihood of indigenous people would also negatively impact the Ojibwe and other indigenous communities. Time is running out and we do not have time to keep patching up pipelines um, instead of building a green way to the future. By reinforcing infrastructure that is not moving towards green alternatives that we have at hand. Thank you again for hearing our concerns today. That's all I have. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Municky. I'm uh, filling in the, the space that Deborah Andreessen has uh, donated. My wife and I live in the lake country up in north central Minnesota. Uh, the foundation of the life and economy of the lakes country in Minnesota is the water. For the last 100 years, it has been the lakes that have drawn people to the area. The resorts, boat shops, food establishments, trade industries, service industries, and so forth, have followed. As the area has grown in population, the tax base has increased providing for government and community services. A pipeline in the area would create a potential hazard. We think of the pipeline in Kalamazoo, Michigan that ruptured and the, uh, in, the embridged pipeline there, uh, damaging about, or dis, di, discharging about one million gallons of fuel into the river, the largest inland spill in the history of the United States. So there's potential for great danger here. And if oil gets in the water, no one is going to build a cabin or retirement spot, wiping out the reasons for folks to come into this area. We need to think long term what would be helpful for the next 100 years and beyond. They're, they ain't making any new water. With well, the water that we've got in the world, that's it. That's all we're gonna get. So we have to take good care of it, be good stewards, and be careful. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Hesed. Um, uh, Melissa Burrell ceded her time to me. Uh, my name is spelled K-H-E-S-E-D. My last name is Bain Evans, B-E-I-N-E-V-A-N-S. Um, I'm not anyone really important. I'm just a person. I live um, on sacred land um, where the waters meet. Um, I drink water. I'm 20 years old and um, I'm hopefully going to be alive for the next 10 years, which is when we need to take action um, to, in order to save our planet and save um, humanity. I've heard a lot about today about how unsafe it is that oil travels through the old pipeline and through trains and trucks, and that's true. It's really unsafe that oil travels that way, and our communities deserve better. Um, it's not going to help if we build a new pipeline because the oil itself is unsafe. The oil that's burning is unsafe. It makes our climate unsafe. And the new pipeline will leak. And investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is, is not the way that we need to go. Um, instead, I think we need to take this opportunity where 
it's not safe for the oil to be flowing through the old pipeline anymore. Let's take this opportunity to pivot and really invest in our communities, invest in renewable energy. Imagine how awesome our future could be if we could um, develop our communities economically based on things like solar and wind instead of tar sands where we have to extract from the ground and um, pollute our waters and our lands. Um, so as someone who lives here, as someone who drinks water and hopefully will live on this land for a long, long time, um, please don't screw this up. <laughs> please deny all permits to line three. My generation depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joe Kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, you remind me a lot of my in-laws. I've seen you a lot the last five years, and I do like them, but I, enough is enough. <laughs> oh, uh, I've been in the construction industry for 35 years. Uh, I've worked on a lot of the Enbridge projects, uh, the maintenance side of it, and the new installation of it. Uh, by far, they do take safety as a high priority. Uh, when we go for restoration, we definitely make sure we leave that better than when we, we found it. Um, this company is, has hired all the best workers. I mean, you've heard it all today. Uh, we have thousands of men and women that are ready to get this project started and, and build it in a safe manner. Uh, we also have a lot of um, men and women in Minnesota that belong to uh, Minnesotans for Line 3 that are not here today to voice their opinion in favor of this project. So I, I, do, I am in support of this project and I uh, hope you approve it. Thank you. Thank you. If your name is on the list, you're welcome to come forward now. Otherwise, we'll add some new names out of the box. Thank you for your time. Um, we cannot be, continue investing in, in uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. Can you state oh, your name, sir? Sorry, my name is Nick Henry. Um, I'm a computational physics student. Um, we're all well, well aware that companies like Enbridge just view the FEIS as the final hurdle, final hurdle to their increased profits, one that has been cleared for every pipeline that has leaked in the past just as this one inevitably will, in one of the nearly 50 bodies of water, including the Mississippi, that the pipeline crosses. This reality undermines the farce of treating the FEIS as a legitimate scientific inquiry. Um, as one previous commentator pointed out, it didn't even evaluate the, um, the groundwater impact in the Lake Superior watersheds. I ask you to treat it as a legitimate scientific inquiry, as a legitimate inquiry, and find the FEIS unsat unsatisfactory, um, as it has already been made clear that the risks for groundwater contamination uh, are far higher than what any sane society would consider acceptable for a project of this magnitude to move forward, as is the case with um, basically all new pipelines. Um, and uh, many people have pointed out that the uh, that replacing an aging pipeline may, uh, if it was just a replacement project, would be may be more environmentally friendly than continuing to use an aging pipeline. Uh, I say let the pipeline die. We cannot uh, invest in new infrastructure when its use is no longer needed. It will simply be phased out of use. Thank you for your time. My name is uh, Ivor Iverson from Golden Valley, Minnesota. Uh, I've been a union commercial carpenter for 43 years, but I'm also a grandfather. We're nearing the 10 year anniversary of the April 10th, 2010 BP Deepwater Horizon oil drilling disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. 
It remains the largest environmental disaster in U.S. history to date, putting an Exxon Valdez spill amount of oil into the Gulf of Mexico every four days over a three-month duration. British Petroleum also said their project was safe, so much so they neglected to consider adequate safety measures. What is adequate? Wetlands and clean watersheds are not $55 barrel commodities. They are the source of our life and health. They are priceless. To ignore the risks to them in the interest of enriching a few international corporations and very temporary jobs is madness and delusional on an epic scale. Both the Gulf of Mexico disaster and the inevitable disasters to come from Alberta tar sands oil extraction are regional problems brought about by international corporations. The United Nations IPCC makes it very clear we can do the math. We have less than 12 years to turn this global problem toward a viable solution. And in our representative democracy, the PUC is the citizen's interface with the laws and regulations protecting ours and future generations' natural legacy. It is a sacred trust of justice and respect in service to the common good by first doing no harm. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do either of you who are sitting there want to go? Hello, uh, my name is Katherine Anderson. I am a senior high school student at the School of Environmental Studies in Apple Valley. I am also an organizer and active member of the Sunrise Movement, but I am not speaking on their behalf today, nor any other organization. I am merely speaking on behalf of myself as a young person concerned for the future of Minnesota. I had prepared a uh, long speech from which I cited my AP notes, textbooks, all sorts of the feists, everything. But I am getting the sneaking suspicion that you know the consequences of what this project could be. You know that the feist is inadequate and self-serving and doesn't have any scientific credibility because of the lack of actual research done. You know the damage that could be done to headwaters, downstream areas, upstream areas. And you know the socioeconomic issues that could come up here. It's a question of whether or not you will care. I did not want to come off as the angry teenager today, but frankly, I'm tired. I was raised for 18 long years watching as the government failed to act on climate change, on issues concerning young people. When will the PUC, the PCA, the DNR, begin to understand that this is their children and grandchildren at risk here? When will we begin to finally put our children and grandchildren first before private profit? These jobs will not benefit Minnesotans for long. They will not be well paying, they will not be long, and they will not do anyone good. Thank you. Uh, my name is Owen Small, E-O-I-N-S-M-A-L-L. -L. Um, and there was a gentleman earlier who talked about, you know, nobody here drove a 1968 Chevy, but mine's a 78 uh, school bus. So um, these things are still in operation, and with proper maintenance and care, they can continue to operate. I also feel uh, it pains me to be on the other side of labor because I support labor, labor as well. I want to talk about the tar sand reason briefly. If you look at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, most of their models indicate that over the coming 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we are going to see a much larger amount of, energy, of uh, tar sand oil coming through and being produced. This Line 3 pipeline is designed to carry tar sand oil, uh, diluted bitumen, and the, specifically that Cold Lake blend that's mentioned in the FEIS is something that I don't think falls in line with the mapping of uh, what would happen with a potential spill in the watershed. Um, one of the topics was shoreline stranding, uh, where 
the oil would find its way to the shoreline, become stranded, etc. cetera. Um, what you'll find along the shorelines in a majority of that part of our state is obviously the monoman, the wild rice. And so what I was basically reading from that report is that anywhere along this line in that watershed where there's wild rice growing, if there's a leak, we are gonna see the destruction of the sacred grain of the Anishinaabe people and uh, part of our economy here in Minnesota. So my recommendation um, moving forward, one is to separate these issues. We have to decommission a very, very uh, poorly maintained pipeline. And I think we should be looking at these as separate issues. Uh, we can't be combining a replacement along a new route with, um, with everything else. As far as the process goes, I do think uh, we need more time to explore other impacts to the Lake Superior watershed. And uh, yeah, I, I think that from the science we've heard, we should um, be thinking about what happens if we decide to keep flowing tar sand oil and uh, the effects that that'll have on the future generation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tina Clark and Tom Watson has ceded his time to me. So I've been working on energy and environmental issues for 30 years, um, first in Washington and then New England. And my family is from Minnesota. I spent um, my summers in the Nisswa area with strong ties to the whole region, St. Cloud and North. And I come as um, someone who has been working on this issue for a long time and also is now working in Denmark for the past three years. Um, I work on climate with scientists there. And I, I really don't envy your position. You are in a very difficult situation because all the assumptions and data that you've been given um, about what's happening with the climate and about the economy, the economic metrics that the industry is giving you are just completely changing. And I'm witnessing it in Europe. Um, in, in Denmark, the national government um, has set a goal of 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels, 70% by 2030. And the scientists there, there's a huge coalition of over 400 scientists who say that this is not enough. They're pushing for more drastic, rapid transition. And the universities there, the social enterprises, the large industry, Maersk, has now committed to going carbon neutral on a much faster time frame. There is a new electric vehicle company in southern Sweden that is going to disrupt the whole automobile industry, 300 miles per gallon on a smaller battery for very low affordable cost, stronger than a Volvo. Their architecture industry, they've got wood now that's stronger than steel. They are looking to shift completely off of all fossil fuels, as is all of Northern Europe, as rapidly. And we are losing out on this market opportunity. What we need to do is quickly shift from prioritizing, investing in these fossil fuel technologies. You know, there are people who enjoy a 1960 Chevy because it's anachronistic. They enjoy the technology. It's a hobby. But none of us choose to buy those as our primary vehicle. That is an outdated technology. We are going to, we are going to see in the coming years, in the next decade, that either we will transition to an electricity-based economy based on wind and solar that are cheaper and safer and healthier and more reliable, or we're going to be left economically far behind the rest of Europe and China. Thank you. Thank Thanks for you. your time. Yeah, Barry, actually second, I guess that's right. But anyhow, Barry Reich, uh, 71 years old, 1948 model. I've been uh, St. Paul. I'm actually third generation uh, St. Paul. I appreciate your patience, and thank you for hearing us out. I was about ready to get out of here. You know, I'm tired of way. I put my name in at 8.30, and I'm finally getting to speak to you. But I, I, you must be, brain must be exhausted. And I, I watched this whole process a year ago, 
and, uh, and I spoke to you before in 2014. When I'll try to say something articulate. Um, first of all, I'd, like I say, I've been a, a year, of my, my entire life in Minnesota. I'm not a scientist, um, retired, and I come in at this because I love Minnesota, I love our environment, and it's changed. It's changed, and I'm just gonna bring a couple of examples. I remember when we used to have winter that lasted until spring, you knew it was spring, spring thaw was time to throw the windows open and it was spring. It wasn't spring every other week, you know. I'd take a look outside. I remember January, usually the coldest month of the year. It didn't go above and below 32 degrees. Uh, look at the, the four inches of frozen slush on the road. Look at the ice, our, uh, the sidewalks. We used to have nice powder snow. Those are just a couple of examples. So things have changed. There's no question about it. I don't, you know, you don't have to look at, uh, at forest fires and ocean riding. We got it happen right here. And a lot of lives are dependent. You know, we talk about jobs. A lot of lives are dependent on that industry in Minnesota, our weather, you know, and including our farmers. Uh, we talk about jobs. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of jobs. You know, I worked at the trades for 25 years. I know what it's like. And, uh, but if I, I'd be hedging my bets on green, I'd be putting my, my money in to learn how to install solar panels or, or, uh, or put up a wind turbine. I wouldn't be putting it into my technology and the pipelines. Um, uh, it's, it's obvious that we're at the end of the line for oil. Tar sands, worst oil, dirtiest, worst, we're, we're, we're coming, oil is history. I don't know what our history holds, but it's not gonna be oil. And, and, and I've been doing my best to make the world a better place since I've, in, the, in my life. You know, obviously things have gotten worse, I and mean, the younger generation is not gonna be happy with me, but I've done my best to live a small footprint life. Sir, um, your time is up. But it's a little bit late in the game for making a smooth transition. You know, oh, have I gone over? I'm sorry, I didn't even know it's out there. But anyhow, uh, time's up for oil. I watched this body make a decision last year, uh, worried about the oil, oil leakage because of Sir, uh, for your, your, your ch too, now, children, right but now. nothing but compares to climate change with, you know, as far as catastrophe. Um, the name that I had got deleted off there. They ceded oh, my time to me. Sorry. No problem. Uh, yeah, so Priya Dalal Whalen ceded her time to me. I am Eric Karn, E-R-I-C-K-A-R-N. Um, something that folks haven't talked about are the negative externalities. Um, folks talked about how, yes, there's still going to be demand for oil, but that demand is diminishing. Why would you invest in a sinking ship? Why would you put more money into something that is going away? Um, the pollution that comes from oil affects us all. It hurts our health. You know, folks who work on these pipelines, they can find a different job. What can't be found, you can't just go out and get different health once you have been poisoned by pollution. Um, yes, the demand is not going to go away, but it is going down. If we make it harder for the supply, those oil companies, they're going to have to charge more. Maybe it'll be more realistic to the actual cost that we all face, those negative externalities. That's uh, my main point, uh, the DAPL, no, Dakota Access Pipeline, that's already leaked, we know this thing's gonna leak. And let's look at this mathematically, risk versus reward. Um, you know, the, uh, if we risk it and build this thing, it can leak into the Mississippi, it can hit the aquifers, all these things that people have already talked about. The reward for building this thing is the status quo. It is more pollution, it is investing in an industry already heavily subsidized for who knows why. It just does not make sense to carry on with the status quo. Um, and it is going to leak. Um, yeah, and it's very clear that we're moving away from fossil fuels. I think I've said everything that I have to say. Furthermore, if you vote in support of this, or let me say, deny the certificate of need, deny the new route, deny this new revision of the document, and if you let this go forward, shame on you. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of Nancy Knorr, who is with uh, Min uh, Jobs for Minnesotans, which is a coalition of labor business leaders um, and support responsible industries in natural resources and development and safe energy transportation. My name is Julie Huber. 
Um, as an organization, we are committed to the principle that our state can preserve both job opportunities and the environment for future generations through the advancement of projects like the replacement of Line 3 pipeline. We urge the PUC to approve final environmental impact statement certificate of need and route permit for the Line 3 replacement project and support this triple bottom line, economic benefit, energy security, and environmental protection. It is disheartening to see the seemingly endless growth of Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area when our rural counties keep losing ground and losing population. According to the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development in Pennington County, the average annual income in 2018 was under $47,000, whereas in Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area it was over $70,000. This privately funded Line 3 replacement project will generate much needed economic energy in our rural areas and tax revenue annuity that creates stronger, more sustainable communities. As we consider the second of the three bottom lines, my work day to day at an electric utility provides a constant reminder of the importance of safe, reliable, afford affordable energy to society. According to the US Department of Transportation data, 10 cents per gallon increase in gas at the pump would add $200 million in additional costs for Minnesota drivers per year, including everyone that drove here today. That doesn't take into consideration the impact of increased energy costs on small businesses, farms, and manufacturers. Having affordable energy in Minnesota is critical to our residents and helps our businesses be more competitive. The third bottom line for the Line 3 replacement project is the undeniable environmental benefits. Pipelines are the safest, most efficient, and reliable way to transport crude oil. This project is the most thoroughly studied in Minnesota history, and Jobs for Minnesotans strongly asserts that the PUC should find the environmental impact statement adequate with the inclusion of the Lake Superior spill modeling. In closing, we urge you to recommend this project moves forward in a timely manner, bringing its triple bottom line benefits to Minnesota. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Mary Jo Cristoforo, and I appreciate you uh, listening to all of us today. I, um, I, just wanna, I just wanna talk about the fact that we here in Minnesota, everyone you've heard today has values, and that the values for our health and our environment, I hope are your priority. They are the priority of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, they are the priority of of thousands of Minnesotans. And I really hope that you think about those impacts for our health, for our environment, for the natural resources that we have here. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough that it is in your hands. Secondly, I, I really wanna talk about the fact that all of our energy, the fossil fuels coming into Minnesota are imported here. We do not create any of our energy unless it's renewable. And it's so, so possible for all of our energy to be renewable here in Minnesota and in every state of this union. And uh, that would make us, I'm just gonna say it again, energy inter independent. And if we are looking to be a resilient state and a leader as we are in the State of the Union, I really hope that you will think about the fact that we can go there we don't need to be importing dirty fossil fuels. We don't need pipelines. We don't, we need to transition into a clean energy future. And so I thank you for your time. I wanna say that um, the EIS is completely inadequate, as you know, with the goal, that you don't line up with the goals and values of the people of the state. And I, I do hope that you will deny the certificate of need. And so thank you for your time. Have a good weekend. I'm Pat, K-A-S-T-N-I-N-G, and Ryan Nelson ceded his time to me. Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to express my support of the Line 3 replacement project. 13,500 pages, 49 public meetings, spill modeling in eight sites representing the watersheds along the preferred route, and it wasn't enough. So the spill modeling in the Lake Superior watershed was an additional requirement of the EIS. The DOC's Lake Superior spill modeling confirms that in the unlikely event a spill from the Line 3 project occurred, it would not introduce risk to Lake Superior. 
Due to the findings of this four-year comprehensive assessment, the most extensive in Minnesota history, the EIS should be deemed adequate. The certificate of need is obvious. Why would we be opposed to replacing an aging, vulnerable pipeline from the 60s with a modern pipe which has a wide range of measures to reduce the likelihood of an oil release? And oh, at no cost to the state of Minnesota. The route permit, over this five plus year review process, including 68 public meetings and endless hours of studies, 90 elected officials, townships and counties have passed resolutions or submitted letters in support of replacing line three. Thus far, easements have been secured along the preferred route from 99% of the landowners. 38 state, federal, and local officials have delivered public comments in favor of the project. As the PUC, you have been charged with the responsibility of reviewing this project and making sure it passes the various state requirements. How many times are other state agencies allowed to appeal your well-researched decisions? Our governor has stated numerous times that if the project follows the process and science, then it should proceed. I'm confused as to the process, which seems to waffle and change and the science which has been researched and documented again and again. But still the line three replacement continues to be subject to the most arduous scrutiny, scientific scrutiny of all time. Please rely on the science and find the EIS adequate and reaffirm your June 2018 unanimous approvals of the certificate of need and route permit. The need and the route have not changed. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello. My name is Ken Pearson. Um, Jamie Gaither ceded her time to me. I'm an attorney. I live in Golden Valley. Uh, I have an economics background, so I tend to follow the money uh, and have a long-standing interest in environmental issues. I have just three points to make today. Uh, one has been beaten to death. It's the, f the proposed final EIS. I would say it still falls short of what it should be. Um, it should more fully address the effects on the St. Louis River estuary and Lake Superior. It would be great if we had an endless supply of fresh water, but we do not. Second point I want to make is that it's important to keep in mind just how much opposition there is to this project. Significant public opposition to projects like this is, in historical terms, it's a relatively recent thing. Um, but the public opposition to the Line 3 project dwarfs the public support. Virtually all of the support for this project, and we've heard it just in the last few minutes here, comes from uh, the very small number of companies and people that have a vested interest in it. That is, that stand to profit from it directly in one form or another. Whereas those opposed are in the millions because it will affect millions of people. And I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with profit, but the equation here is pretty lopsided. It puts large sums, this project would put large sums in the pockets of very, very few people. Well, again, harming millions. It's no wonder that there's opposition given this lopsided equation. Third and final thing is, and I know you know this, but it's so hard for all of us as as human beings to kind of remember this sometimes, you have the power to stop this project. I don't envy you as commissioners who face the pressure of Enbridge and the other small but quite powerful groups that support this project want to cash in on it. And I don't envy you as parents and community members who have to face the really hard questions. I know you get, I know you get them about this project um, and the damage that it would cause. It is regarded as one of the most environmentally destructive projects on planet Earth because of the extraordinarily high carbon cost associated with it, the carbon emissions. Sir, we all know how your, hard it is to change our minds. Thank you for your comment, sir. We need to, you need to, you've reached your time limit. I'm sorry? You've reached your time limit. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm just asking you to deny the certificate of need. Thank you. Is Nils, Nils Deline or Shea Peoples here to speak? My name is Penny Ives. Shea Peoples has ceded her time to me. Can you speak into the microphone a little? Oh, sorry. 
Um, Yes, my name is Penny Ives. Shea Peoples has ceded her time to me today. I am here because I am concerned about the young people and the world that they will inherit from us who are old. And there you have heard many people speak eloquently about the reasons, the, the, the lack of um, adequacy of the FEIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, and, and the risk of pollution to our waters that can happen. You've also heard people speak about the dangers of transporting oil by various means and saying, well, pipelines are safer, but pipelines do leak. And the, with the new pipeline, it would double the amount of oil that is being brought in. It would encourage us to slow the rate of change. We really, we have very little time left. The um, international bodies have stated that we have like 12 years or less, it's now they're saying it's less, in which we need to drastically reduce our greenhouse gas um, emissions or the future will not be there for the young people. And I'm very concerned about that. Already there is, there is winter flooding in, in southern Minnesota and Iowa, which is really unusual, oh. as well as lots of other environmental damage. So please uh, say no to this pipeline for the sake of the future. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody in the audience and those people who watched and online or in the uh, overflow room for your participation today and respectful comments. The commission will be in recess until Monday at 8.30 a.m.